Hello, everybody, and welcome to Knox Makers Tuesday Night Show and Share. We're here to show what we're working on and uh, what all is going on. And today we have uh, we have five presenters, starting with Sue and her lasers for quilting. I am trying to share my video camera. <laughs> I'm excited to see how you are mixing lasers and quilting. Ah, well, <laughs> they're subservient to quilting. Oh, <laughs> sorry, John Dell. <laughs> <laughs> so well, can you go to the next slide? I sure can. So I thought I'd start off by, by showing what a rotary ruler looks as used for what I didn't put in the picture when I was is the actual rotary cutter. So you use the ruler as you can see it's marked so you know how many inches or half inches whatever and you just slice it off your pieces. This is made out of eighth inch acrylic and I thought huh, huh I took a laser class hmm I bet I can so next slide, I grabbed some acrylic and I did a couple of test cuts um, or, or etching, uh, what I thought was etching uh, in, in one case. Um, it, it was sort of a deep etch uh, as I found out later. So I am now, I think I'm ready. So if you go to the next slide. Yeah, they may have looked okay, the test cut on the big piece, but uh, when I did the first square or, or the first ruler, uh, I found out they were a little bit too deep and they snapped. Um, you can't see it really well. I don't know if you can zoom in and get there, but at about the, the next one inch mark down, you'll see additional uh, packing tape. Yeah, right about where you're oh, ready. Right there. Yeah, where, where it had busted the first time and I had taped it back together. So I, you know, taped the top piece on again and I'm just really careful with it. Um, so yeah, that should be that uh, they were a little bit too deep. So next slide, back to the laser cutter, back to <laughs> redoing um, the definitions, if you will. I'm not up on the laser term, sorry guys. And started cutting some more. So next up, next slide. Uh, I wanted to go ahead and paint. Uh, my first thought is I would be as beautiful as a store-bought one and do the dashes yellow and then, it, uh, no, I quickly abandoned that when I found out how much trouble it actually is to do all that painting. Um, how, how, how did you, you paint work? on how do you paint on acrylic? What kind of paint do you use? Well, um, I started with the smallest brush that you see there, the one in the center, just to be able to try and get in the cracks. And I started with uh, a wash, um, a, a paint wash. Now, I think Thomas would probably know what I'm talking about, and you do too, with mm -hmm. uh, miniatures. There's yeah. a specific type of paint that uh, the pigments will settle into the low spots. And, and that came to me, came, came as the recommended paint. So I got some of that and um, well, it didn't work out exactly like I had hoped. Um, it was kind of smeary and when I tried to clean it up with the sponge brush or the sponge, it would wipe out of the crack and it didn't want to come off later. And when I tried to use my fingernail to scrape it off the top, uh, it was scraping the paint out of the crack as well. So I abandoned that. Next, I went to enamel paints, tried those. Um, again, I, I'm not good. Um, I really have to, to hats off to uh, <laughs> Thomas for being able to paint those little bitty things. Um, but I found that even with the enamel paint, uh, I, I would try and use the sponge while it was wet mm -hmm. and, and just take off the top. But again, it was taking all of it off. So I finally decided, okay, that's it. 
I'm going to do the model paints, uh, even if they are um, oil paints and not water cleanup. Much to my delight, um, they are water cleanup now. Um, so that was good. And the model paints worked. I could take the, the sponge and wipe off the top. And it was great. Awesome. So on the next picture, next slide. Well, that wasn't the one I thought it would be, but okay. Uh, we'll go with that one. <laughs> These are the other um, the other rulers that I cut out of that first batch. Uh, you'll recognize the the one on the right on the striped material uh, is the one that it has uh, the packing tape on it to hold it together. Um, the depth was adjusted for the one on the left. Those two together uh make what's called a perfect right rectangle in, in the quilting world so you could do the the one on the pink fabric with the pink fabric and then the others with another one and create different designs one of the other things i tried to do too was something called a um a quick quarter which is the long skinny uh, one that is on the green and you can't see it really well, but in the middle, it's a half inch wide, and in the middle, there's I, I did a cut, um, and I thought, cool, now I'll be able to take the rotary cutter and cut down through the middle, which is what the quick quarter should do. But sadly, uh, it, it's not wide enough. So for now, I can just use it to draw a line um, from corner to corner to mark diagonals to make triangles out of. All right, next slide. We'll see what's up next. Alrighty. And this one uh, is what started the whole project. Uh, you can't see all the markings really well, but it's a 12 and a half inch ruler. And if you zoom in on the right hand side, uh, you can maybe get a better, you can see how the fabric it extends beyond the edge of the ruler. Mm -hmm. Like right there. Yes, and that and that's that's why you have that ruler so you can have a perfect square when you're done. You cut all the fabric off. Oh, that, so you go in and trim it. Yes, you use it to trim it to be a perfect square. So that's what started the project. While you zoomed in there, you're also seeing the the inch numbers. They're beautiful. Um, <laughs> you did a nice time. job. I tried uh, laser cutting those. The um, the first time I thought it didn't print um, or it didn't cut. So I thought, okay, I forgot to do the object path command. I made doubly sure I did for this one. This is the second batch of rulers that I did and, and it still didn't. So good thing I know vinyl cutting and what vinyl, <laughs> Adhesive can do. Mm -hmm. So we have um, vinyl uh, cut numbers there. Oh. But it works. And those must be really small. Did you have trouble peeling those off and putting them on? Um, what I, not really. Um, I had to use tweezers to hold them, but I was able to roll the paper and then the numbers popped up the top of the needle so I could peel them out and off. Yeah, they're wow. quarter inch. Nice job. That looks really nice. Thank you. Yeah. All righty. Is there another slide or? Yes, there's, there's a couple more. Okay. Are you ready for the next one? Yeah, I am. Okay. You might want to zoom out. Good point. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so now that I've had you zoom out, you might want to zoom in onto that lower one. Uh, okay. The lower one is one you've seen. Uh, that's what was on that previous slide. And it shows the, the 22 and a half degree cut uh, marks that I put there so I could line it up with the quilt itself. Um, that's not on any purchased ruler, um, but that's something that I wanted to be able to square that up. 
and if you then now roll to the top, what there to the left is that first one I showed you in the paint job. And this is the paint job of the second one. Um, if you scroll down a little bit so you can see some of the red lines on the first one, uh, you, you see they're, they're kind of messy there. <laughs> yeah. But the one on top was much better. Uh, part of the difference when I went to cut the first batch, thankfully Tracy was there. I wish Tracy or John Dell was there as I did some of the others as I was having questions and just kind of punted um, without them being there. But for the first one, Tracy had said to go ahead and peel the paper off the plexiglass before cutting, which I did. When I went back to do it again, I noticed um, as I looked for a, a scrap piece in the in the trash can, I noticed that not everyone peels off that top piece, so or the top paper. So I decided because the I had a two by four sheet and I was going to have a lot of leftover, I prefer to leave the paper on. Uh, also, I thought it's going to help me with the painting, and it certainly did. It helped keep the the paint in the lines and not smearing all over. The only other issue I had was when I dipped it, and if you can zoom in. On which part? Um, in the upper one to okay. where you can see, yeah, right there is good. Whoop, right there. Um, so on the line that's between the seven and the eight, um, because mm -hmm. those are the same depth, the cuts, the vertical and the horizontal lines are the same depth. I was getting a lot of, just like the wash, the paint was spreading. And part of that was because I was loading up the brush and starting at one of those intersections. Mm -hmm. So it was revisiting painting and how to paint. Um, and, and later as I, as I got further along, I realized that and started in between the, the, the dashes. So you, if you can go ahead and zoom back to normal. Mm -hmm. Now, while I thought that leaving uh, the paper on was an excellent idea, um, there is a price to pay. And this is where the final slide comes in at, the next slide. Instead of one big sheet of paper to pull off, like you see scrolled on the bottom, mm -hmm. You have a lot of little pretty pieces to pull off. Um, there were three of those bins, and that one's not very full um, of little bitty pieces. So, and just for those that are wondering, well, do I leave the paper on or off? Something to consider. Um, David had a question as to what the thickness was of your acrylic. Got here late. This, was, this is eighth inch. Uh, and he my, wanted to know where you got it. Ah, I got it at, um, um, starts with a P. John Dell, Tracy, where do we get it from? Piedmont Plastics. Mm. Piedmont Plastics, there's another place in town. Uh, you can Google it, uh, but I don't remember the name. It's near Central. Um, over in that part of town. Um, sadly, I wasn't able to get a two by four sheet. I had to buy a full sheet and they would cut it down for me. Um, but I'm not worried about that so much as the rulers that you saw in the presentation sell for at least $20 a piece, some of them more. Uh, the biggest ruler on the last slide, I saw priced anywhere from 60 to, you know, close to $100. So I, I think I definitely got my money worth, and I have lots of plexiglass left over. My next project, I want to continue doing rulers, but I need them a quarter inch thick. They're not going to be this big. Um, and I see that there's been a lot of really good responses on Mattermost. I posted the question last night, but I haven't had a chance to read through them. So I, I will be doing that 
um, tonight and getting back. But my project is more rulers, not as big as these, um, and, but much curvier and different shapes. And again, you use it for quilting, uh, for the free motion quilt to hold the ruler down and then follow the ruler with the, um, with the machine to get your design. While you're sewing or? Yes, while the machine's okay. running. So you can do straight lines or clamshells. Um, those who quilt uh, have an idea of what I'm, I'm, I'm saying. Um, just the different designs. Wow, that's, that's a lot. I didn't realize you used those for the actual quilting. I thought it was more for cutting the pieces out. But I haven't done any of the quilting on machine, just a little bit by hand and not very much. I'm not much of a quilter. So the problem, you could use the eighth inch on the machine, on the home machine, but you have to be careful because it's not thick enough and the it can get trapped under the needle and break the needle and the ruler. Oh, that's and yeah, that's bad. <laughs> it's going to be for the quarter inch, um, the quarter inch ones. That way it won't, mm -hmm. it won't, it won't move on you. Or if you don't have that risk. Oh, awesome. Well, you're going to come back and show us those when you got them, right? Oh, yes. I, awesome. I need to keep lasers being a servant of quilting. <laughs> got it, John Dale? All right. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Oh, there was another, there were another oh, couple of pictures okay. here. Do you want to yeah, go back? There's two other things I did. Um, that was, that's showing what, why I did the red lines the way I did. Mm. Um, and, and again, that's to trim it down and to keep things square. Uh, the next slide is one of the other rulers. Um, so you can use it to not only mark, but to cut as well. Now on that ruler, I didn't mark the center point and I wish I would have to be able to place it on the backing fabric right to place it center. I just kind of had to eyeball each time. And I pencil, drew the pencil lines. But yeah, it can be many different things that you use the templates for. It isn't just for fabrics. Oh, awesome. Well, well, thank you. You're very welcome. All righty. And now we have Joe, who is going to enlighten us with spring management. And I can go in all kinds of different areas with spring. You know, we're talking yeah. about springy springs. Are we talking about water springs? Uh, this is the spring of the year spring. Oh. Okay, spring of the year. That's a good one too. Yeah. Spring. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, go to the first slide. Alrighty. If you're a beekeeper um, in Tennessee, the first time you see this, it means the nectar flow is starting. This will be about mid to end of March. And that's when everything in the bee colonies starts happening. Mm. Uh, next colony, I mean, <laughs> slide. Uh, this is, I've got six colonies. Now this one uh, was really doing very well in early and mid-March. And uh, so when it's like that, there's a pretty good chance they're gonna swarm. And uh, it's good to try to keep them from swarming because uh, you don't get as much honey. So if you look at this configuration, you'll see a shallow box on the top and then two deep ones below that. What, it, what exactly does it mean when you say they're going to swarm? What is that? Uh, swarming is uh, the way that a bee colony reproduces. Okay. That's a natural phenomenon. You can't, it's, you don't want it as a beekeeper, but you can't stop it really because it's a natural way they reproduce. Um, when I first started keeping bees, the book said that if your bee colonies swarm, it's a sign of poor beekeeping. 
And now they say, try not to let them swarm if you can. Mm -hmm. So the thinking has evolved. Um, what they do is they divide. Half the bees leave and start a new colony, and then you've got the old one still left behind. So that's what swarming is. Okay. So uh, the configuration here, you see the sh shallow one on the top and the two deep ones below. Mm -hmm. Typically the um, brood is in the bottom two and the top ones and ones on up from there is where the bees will store the honey. So um, if you set that top box off and look down on the top of the frames of that first box, next slide, you'll see that. And for early and mid-March, that's quite a bit of bees. So now if you take this box and set it off and look at the top of the next one, next slide, you'll see this. That's quite a bit of bees. So um, this is these two um, slides that I just showed you are where the brood nest is. The brood nest is shaped like, a, imagine a basketball in there, in that uh, box. And that brood nest will be in the shape of a basketball and about that size. So next slide. If you take one of the frames out right in the middle of the brood nest, you'll see this. You can see it's round and you get like a, um, three or four of these in a row, you know, like that. And that's going to be a lot of bees that are going to be hatching out. And when a lot of bees hatch out, you get crowding. Um, there's congestion in the brood nest. The queen doesn't have any place to lay. And, they're, and these bees are thinking, this is no good. We got to divide. We're going to swarm. We're going to reproduce. They're feeling strong. So uh, what, you know, uh, the, the theory on what I'm doing here is to try to break up the brood nest so that there's more room for the queen to lay and less congestion of the bees. And hopefully that will... A delay or keep them from swarming. So what I do is I take frames like this that have a lot of brood on them and I uh, put every other one with a frame that's empty that doesn't have any on in it. And so hopefully that will spread things out and give them more room and they and they won't swarm. If you can get into mid-April, maybe end of April, they're probably not going to swarm. That's that's the time as they decide, like right now, they're deciding. So um, next slide. I wanted to show you this. Um, you see those frame, those uh, cells that have the little round balls on there? Yeah, they do. OK, those are drone cells. So, you know, one might ask, you know, why are they growing drones unless they plan to swarm? So that could be another sign, you know, it's natural for them to have drones, but um, that could be another indication you start seeing a lot of drone cells. You know what those are? Those are the males. Yeah, right. Now I want you to, you see the bottom of the frame, that piece of wood across? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now. Go down. Now, you see that cell that looks like a peanut? Uh, this one right there? Yeah. That's a queen cup. Ooh. It's natural for them to have a queen cup or two, but if you see 10 of them and they've got larvae in them, these bees have decided to swarm. There's nothing you can do about it. Hmm. So, I don't know if I'll be successful or not. We'll see. So, uh, next slide. Sometimes you have to find the queen. Um, you don't want to find the queen unless you have to because she's hard to find. You might have 15 or 20,000 bees and there's one of them that looks different from all the others. 
And so can you find that? And not only that, a bunch of them are mad at you and they're flying in your face and making a lot of racket and it can be tense. Um, so can you find the queen there? Maybe there. Yeah, next slide. How about there? That's yeah, guess. next slide. Mm, there we go. Yeah. yeah you see how she's good. longer? Yeah. Well, a lot of brown, times. Brown. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times she'll be a little slightly different color. Um, some queens are the same color as the bees, and that really makes it hard to find. But um, she's a little bit different color and longer, and then you go through the hive and you look for eggs. And if you find eggs, you know that queen is going to be right there close. So next slide. This is another one of my colonies. It was doing really good first of March, a lot of brood. And uh, about the second or about the second week in March, there was no brood. And so that's a bad sign. That may mean that you don't have a queen. And so I waited a couple of weeks hoping, you know, maybe they're super seeding or something and there'll be a queen show up and then I'll have brood. And uh, so I got kind of nervous about that. So I took a frame that had eggs on it out of that hive that we saw before and I put it in here so that they would have the resources to make a queen if they needed to. So next slide. There's that frame. And uh, this is about a week and a half after I put it in there. And you can see those two white um, dots on the left of that frame, kind of, yeah, right in there. Now go to the next slide. I already zoomed it. There they are, that's the same ones. Um, the top one, sure enough, had the larvae in there and they were making a queen. And about a week and a half later, I had a queen, a laying queen in there. Well, I guess I did the right thing on that. You never know, but I think I did. Um, now, do you ever order queens? Oh, yeah. I ordered six this year. I've requeened all of mine. Oh, Eleanor okay. helped me. We did it just the other day. I normally don't requeen. I normally uh, just let them take care of that themselves. Mm -hmm. But I thought I would give it a try, and uh, I'm not... I don't know. I'm still learning about that. If that's a good idea or not. Some people say you want to just keep the queens and let them make their own because they're suited for your locality and environment and they're they're hardier than any that you will order. So I don't know. Um, next slide. This year I set up an observation hive. This is really fun. Next slide. Yeah, those are fun. Yeah. You can get pictures like this with an observation hive. It was really neat when I was looking in there, all these bees that are around her, they all, their antennas were like they were rubbing her. It was really, it was really <laughs> neat. <laughs> but there weren't any bees at her head, so. How about that? Well, I think that's it. All righty. Well, thank you so much. I love, I love to look at bees. Oh, and me too. <laughs> they're really fun. Yeah, they are. Little, little intimidating, but but fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, now we have uh, Mark, and it looks like he's. Fuming Wimshurst? Help, help me out there. I'm afraid I might have butchered that. <laughs> You're muted. There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, that's, this is a two-part uh, project. Uh, fuming is a process of darkening wood with ammonia. And this project, I did, I fumed uh to make it dark this is a really old uh procedure 
Uh, if you've heard of arts and crafts furniture, mission furniture, it was real popular uh, with white oak. White oak is what you want to use when you fume. It's a uh, real strong ammonia that makes it, uh, makes it like chocolate brown. Mm. If you want to go to the first lab, I'll show you what it is. All righty, let's see. Okay, this is, what I'm making here is a wind surge machine. And uh, I'll just kind of leave it at that and we'll, we'll make it a surprise when we get to that point. Uh, but that, that right there, are, it's uh, white oak pulleys. And uh, that's to show you a before. And go to the next slide. That's another part of this machine, the white oak piece of steel on it, obviously. Okay, go to the next one. This right here is uh, a fuming chamber. It's just a plastic tub with a rubber seal on the bottom. And I got it clamped down. And the reason I did that is because I'm working with 28% ammonia and it'll take your head off. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it's bad stuff. You should wear a respirator. I don't have one. So I do it on a breezy day outside. And uh, I fill up a coffee can about half full with ammonia and put it in that chamber. And on this particular project, it sat in there for six days. Uh, you can do it in about three days if you have enough ammonia in there. Uh, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. That's more of the machine. Okay, go to the next one. It, sh it shows all the parts on the inside there. Okay, go. You can see my coffee can in there. Yeah. Okay, go to the next one. That's a piece out of the chamber, and uh, it was a test piece, and I just cut it in half uh, to see how deep it was. And it actually goes all the way in, but it goes real dark. Uh, about an eighth to a quarter inch in. So you can actually fume uh, white oak and then sand it and finish it after you fume it. Uh, I, I sanded it before, but I didn't really have to. That would be handy if you wanted to like, change the color of them and still be able to work on the wood. Right, uh, right. You, yeah, you can damage it and sand, sand the defect out or whatever. And it'll stay the same color. So, uh, wait a minute. I, I think I missed something. How, how do you get the, the, the ammonia on the wood? Or is this ga gaseous? It's, it's in the, uh, you put it in that chamber and, and it evaporates into gas and it uh, darkens the wood. And that took about six days right now. But it, is it, uh, is, isn't ammonia like, isn't that flammable? No, it's not flammable, but it's very hard on your nose. Okay. Household ammonia will work, but not so good. Uh, here's what I got. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, uh, a little bit. Uh, ammonium hydroxide, 28%. Okay, go to the next slide. There's all the parts. Now you're probably wondering what the heck it is, right? <laughs> Okay, go to the next I am. one. I am. <laughs> yeah. I think there's some folks here that do know what it is. More parts right there. This is with oil on it. It looks kind of dull looking without the oil, but the oil really, and I use uh, Danish oil, it really it's, makes the grain stand out and, and darkens it. Yeah, it's okay, a really rich one. color that you've got. Yeah, it's definitely a different color, chocolate brown. Okay. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. The next slide is the actual finished product. I think. Well, no, it shows it, but it shows before and after. That's white oak before and white oak after it's fumed. That's amazing. Pretty drastic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, go to the next one. Oh, I, I got them in different order. But let me explain what a wind surge is. Windsurf is an electrostatic generator. It's got uh, two, originally they were, uh, it, it was invented in 1880, 
and originally there were glass discs, but plastic actually works better. So right there, I'm drilling a plastic disc uh, for a, a drive hub. And uh, the two discs counter-rotate close to each other, about an eighth inch apart. And they what create sort a static. <laughs> what sort of uh, plastic are you using? It's, uh, you can use polycarbonate, but I just use acrylic. Yeah, I, th I, I think you might want to take a look at uh, uh, Teflon uh, or, or some of these, these fluorite plastics because I think these are at the bottom. So, you know what the Tribal Electric series is? Oh. Huh. Yeah. Well, so, uh, the, do you know what the, the, the Tribal Electric series is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so, so things like Teflon, the fluorite plastics, these are at the bottom of it. So I think maybe if you use Teflon, you, you might get better results. Huh. Uh, that, that's interesting. I, I've used uh, PVC, uh, polycarbonate, PEG, and acrylic. And uh, acrylic's the cheapest. And, well, PEG is fairly cheap. It's harder to find. But I, I never saw any difference between any of them. But it could be that the Teflon... Although the Teflon's more expensive, I'm sure. Yeah, I I, I I can send you one of these these tribal electric series if you want. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I left a protective layer on the plastic. I, I leave it on there until I get almost done, and then I take it off. But uh, right there, I'm just uh, drilling three mounting holes and a little metal piece for to locate the holes. So you can go to the next slide. There's the drive hub. It's got a little groove for a, a belt drive. Okay, go to the next one. There's the drive hub mounted on the disc. Okay, you can go to the next one. There's the finished machine. And I wish I had had more steps to get to that to show, but I don't have the picture. Uh, that machine is 100% done except for uh, there's some white wood on top of the fastener that I've painted black later. And let me further explain that. It's two counter rotating discs, belt drive, and it, it generates a static charge and the discs have oil sectors pasted on them and uh, collectors to collect the charge and it's got two capacitors to store the charge. And when they get saturated, uh, you see a big spark between the two balls. Uh, and those balls are adjustable, so you can spread them out. And, and that machine right there makes a uh, seven to eight inch spark. Oh. Okay, go to the next one. Uh -huh. I was hoping you had that a picture of that. A seven inch spark there. Okay, go to the next one. That's awesome. There's an older machine. That one made a six inch part. I've made several machines. In fact, that first one you saw was my seventh one. Okay, go to the next one. Here's a spark. Stop, stop motion. <laughs> Took it from a video frame. Uh, and these are hand crank. You get a hand crank on Okay, go to the next one. Oh, so you have a lot of practice making these. Yeah, <laughs> just another another shot of a spark. Okay, go to the next one. That's in process on the machine before the. That's just red oak, and it doesn't fume well. But that was the machine before. That's Webster's number seven or six. There. Okay, go to the next one. That same same thing. Uh, I thought I had one showing the drive mechanism to make it counter rotate, but maybe not. Go to the next one. There's the, the machine finish. Uh, that was wind search number six. That's just a stained red oak. Okay, go to the next one. And there's an the eight inch spark on that one. You'll, you'll notice something too. There's a different electrode configuration. Uh, 
that one looks more aggressive. It's a little bit harder to build because those arms have to be on a friction point. The whole thing's got to be strong enough to support those electrodes and those brass balls on the end get kind of heavy. You also notice that uh, there's a small ball and a large ball on the end of each electrode. And the reason for that, this is kind of amazing to me, is, is uh, it's a DC machine. And depending on, and the machine randomly charges, and depending on which way it's charged, you'll get a longer spark going from a small ball to a large ball. And I don't remember whether it's negative to positive or positive to negative, but one way or the other, you'll get a larger spark. So if the machine was charged the other way, those will, Electrodes would be like a mirror image of that, just the opposite. That might be the last one. I, I think it'd probably be where, when the when the when the large ball is uh, negatively charged, because that means uh, you'd have a surplus of electrons on the 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 the, the negative ball, and it's yeah. larger, so you'd have more electrons, and you can fit more electrons there than you can than you can take off or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and theoretically, the larger ball, the larger, the better. The small ball, you cannot go over size or, or it won't, the spark won't jump. There's an optimum size for the power. Have you, have you, uh, have you thought about, uh, have you made any sort of measurements about what the, the surface charge density of this sort of thing is? No, no. Yeah, I think you can. I think you can get these like I think they're called uh, surface voltmeters uh, uh, on eBay, and you can get them used for like maybe a hundred bucks or something like that. Yeah, I borrowed one from work. Oh, okay. And, and it, uh, I worked at a printing company. I'm retired now, but uh, they had a device for measuring static charge. Yeah. And, and I blew it up. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, I know, and I felt kind of bad about it. They didn't. Requirement yeah. to pay for it the the other way you could uh, measure the charge is through uh, what do they call these things? It's a uh, it's a jar with uh, two two like a like a foil yeah, foil yeah. kind of caliper. What's that? Called? Is that a Leiden jar? No, that's not yeah, a Leiden jar. It's not a Leiden jar. A Leiden jar is a capacitor. Uh, but I yeah. know what you mean. That, yeah, I but you. you you can you can calibrate those things, but depending on the, the angle of deflection of the two foil fins, so you'd be able to tell how much charge it is. Oh uh, yeah, that that would. Uh, I've got a video that I'm, I'm going to show you. If that's okay. Uh, I'm not sure how there. well videos work. Um, if Billy could chime in, you are now on. Um, yeah. I know that we've had problems with them in the past. Well, we tested it. So, okay, you are now. All righty. Can you see it? Yep. back yep you're back <laughs> anyway uh that uh one third machine that i fumed that i sold to a guy in australia that, that was the video that he did of it uh but that's about all i got i got one more video i think if you want to see it i, I don't know if you got enough time though probably not 
Come on, you got two more. What, what, what do people, uh, what do people do with these, these Wimhurst machines? They, they, Is it just collectors or? Yeah, they're just for amusement. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, they, they pay pretty good money for them. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I don't think there's been sort of like uh, commercial applications of these things since like the 1900s. Yeah, yeah. And, and who knows what they were then. Uh, I, th I think these were used in like the spark gap transmitters. So like before we had like AM or FM radio or like telegraph or anything, we had spark gap. Right. So I, I think I think these were uh, used as a as a voltage source for spark gap generators. Right, right. But, but, those are, but yeah, but those are illegal now because they destroy the, the radio spectrum. This, this one here is a, a swap, swap blood cans. This is a commercial one that I restored. This was sold in about 1930. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, I might be away from the microphone, but it's got the hand crank on this side. And the electrodes are set up a little different here. Let's see what it will do. Not not near as impressive, but still a cool little machine. All right. Well, thank you very much. I think that was pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> now we have Keith, and he's going to show us a toolbox. All right. Hey. See it. Well, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, that was a really cool presentation, Mark. It, it uh, was super impressive. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, a toolbox mm -hmm. that I made. And um, really, a, a couple of us in the woodworking area have decided to uh, provide or make toolboxes for ourselves, try to uh, make it a little bit more functional than just the, the tubs that we have out there and uh, spruce up the place a little bit. And this is, this is my version of it. So maybe, Sarah, if you could go to uh, the first page. Okay. And this is the the output. Uh, I'll be going through some of the design decisions and things that uh, I did in order to make it, but it's basically um, three three shelves, and uh, I really wanted to make um, those shelves removable because, as you all know, uh, the the member storage is you know can be fairly far away from where you're at. Even if I'm doing woodworking, it's on the other side of the divider by the by the miter saw, so I'm not going to want to be running back and forth to the to the toolbox for this tool and that tool and so on. So um, maybe make me go to the, the next page. And this just shows I'm pulling out. Um, and uh, maybe one more page will show you the actual, how you can remove them. So um, yeah, so there's just uh, three shelves I put in there and the, the uh, drawers just kind of fit right into the rabbits that go around the those shelves and the shelves are mounted to full extension slides. Um, they're not quite, they don't go all the way to the back of the uh, back of the toolbox just because I want a little extra space in order to fit them into the shelf and not have to worry about, you know, kind of leveraging it in or anything. Um, and uh, I tried to make it a, a variety of heights. So I have a small one for just like chisels and safety glasses and that sort of thing. And then uh, the two are uh, the two next ones are a little bit taller, um, but uh, and then the top one actually has extra space on top. So there's a variety of different uh, sizes I can put in each of these shelves. Um, How much uh, you call those? What extension hinges? Ex extension or what, extension what do you call slides? Those yeah, full extension, extension slides. slides. Yeah. How much can the extension slides hold? Um, there's different ones. This is pro I think these were like 50 pounds. So I think plenty, plenty, um, but you can actually size them in terms of length and size them in terms of uh, capacity, uh, weight capacity and so on. So 
Um, these were just handy to get, so they were the ones I chose. All right, um, maybe next slide. I can't really remember the. Okay, yeah, and so this is um, a detail of the uh, joint I used to make the box. It's called a, uh, it's not a lock miter, it's, um, uh, I can't think of it right now, but um, if you make just butt joints, it's particularly plywood, um, then you can see the, uh, um, you can see the, the laminations, which, you know, could be a decorative element. I didn't want to see that. Um, and actually, it, doing a butt joint on plywood is not the strongest joint. Um, the, uh, um, and so this is kind of combines a miter joint where you, you just cut 45 degrees and, and put them together. Um, miter joints are nice at that they hide the, the, hide the laminations, um, but they're a little tricky to glue up because they just tend to slip. There's no kind of right angle force you can put on easily. So they tend to slip around a little bit. So this actually has a fair amount of glue surface. And what's really nice, what I like about it is, is that as you're, glue, as you're clamping things together, they naturally tend to want to align square. So um, it, it's really helpful. Um, and besides that, uh, even this is not a super, super strong joint and it's a big box and it's heavy. Um, so what I actually did is you can see um, those kind of ovals going up on the, uh, up on the sides of the boxes. Those are actually the ends of dowels that I put at 45 degrees across that joint. Um, just, just to reinforce it a little bit, you know, perpendicular to the direction that it's going to separate on. So, um, yeah, just a, just a great little joint. Um, the only problem is, is that it takes a couple of, you know, really dedicated router bits to, um, to cut it and it's a little fiddly when you're actually doing it. So it's, so it takes, a, it takes some trial and error to put it together. All right, uh, next slide. And here's, I have a couple here that are just going through the assembly process. And uh, this is what the board all laid out. And you can see the blue tape there. Um, I didn't take a picture of it, but uh, um, there's actually blue tape kind of spanning all of those, uh, those joints. And uh, I have it running the length of it as well. So if you go to the next slide, and you use that actually to help you put it together. So you just kind of roll it up like a, like a cinnamon roll um, when you're gluing it. So um, yeah, once again, it works really well. Um, I've done it on smaller boxes than this, and this is the first time I tried it this big. The only downside here is that if you have any glue ske squeeze out that goes underneath that tape, that tape tends to spread it out and make it a little bit harder to, to get the glue off uh, um, once you're trying to finish it. Okay, next slide. Yeah, it's just some band clamps, uh, trying to get things now solid. Next slide again. Yeah, I used the same sort of joint on the, on the back side of it. So, um, and one more thing, I think I actually have the, the clamps on it for real. One more slide. Yeah, so, and you know, you leave it here for overnight and it's, it's solid, I, you know, the uh, measuring it, keeping it all square um, and so on. Like I said, having those, those uh, miter, miter lock joints help. Um, to keep it square as well. So now I have a big old box um, with some with the, some slides in there. Next slide. Yeah, so, oh, I, I thought I had it. Um, so I don't know whether you noticed, um, in the, uh, the, the, the front door of it is actually uh, glued up wood, you know, and it's like 18 inch square almost. Um, and I, I I was just going to glue up the wood and uh, be done with it. But when I got it, it all glued up, I look, took a look at it and I was like, you know what, this is a pretty wide door. Um, and if I don't do anything with it, it's gonna warp. You know, I have terrible problems. If, 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 something, if something wood is gonna warp, it warps on me. So I decided yeah. to what's known as uh, breadboards, which is a way of mounting a piece of wood perpendicular to the grain of the, of the, of the door um, in such a way that it allows it to, it keeps it from warping and it allows the wood to expand and contract. So this is a, a couple of slides um, showing that. So the way you do that, you actually create a very tall fence on your table saw and then create a, a, a long tenon um, in order to fit into this breadboard end. And you'll see how it goes along. Let me go to the next slide. 
All right. Yeah, and this is just actually running the uh, the board through the the fence. You can see I'm taking off a just a rabbit here. Okay, next slide. So you're you're actually sawing it there. We actually saw. Yeah, this is with like this is for the picture. I'm not sawing it right now, but this is the whole okay. setup. Yeah. Yeah, and this is the uh, the assembly of the breadboard. And I think people will recognize it now. Um, and so what you do is you 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 create this long tenon. And then uh, the breadboard end, actually, this is one way of doing it. You have a, just a, uh, a mortise that goes all the way through, or a channel goes all the way through. And then you drill some holes along the, uh, along the, the, that tenon. Um, the middle one you keep very, very tight, um, but the ones towards the end, you actually loosen up a little bit. You can see this is kind of elongated. And the reason for that, it allows this panel uh, the panel to expand and contract with the temperature and the humidity, um, but it still keeps it uh, um, it keeps it solid. It keeps it tight. It keeps that breadboard end tight against the uh, tight against the panel itself. Okay, next slide. Once you do that, you just trim off all those pegs and you trim off the ends of the breadboard. Um, this is a new toy I got. It's called a, a Shaper Origin, and it's kind of a Fusion between a router and a CNC, so you actually handheld it, um, but it allows you to define what you want to cut um, using um, CAD tools or drawing tools and so on. What I'm doing using it here for is to mortise in um, the uh, the mortises for the for some handles on top. Um, yeah, it's really handy. Um, and uh, uh, it's actually fairly easy to use if you're used to dealing with a mortise, uh, with your used to dealing with a uh, a router. Um, and it, uh, it it's actually uh, pretty, as I said, pretty handy. So next slide, I think I just show it the, the, the yeah. So those just had have the handles now screwed in, and that tape there is actually kind of neat. So the uh, that shaper origin can recognize those little domino shaped things and then kind of calibrate itself to know. So it creates kind of a, a, a planar coordinate system based on that. And it's actually accurate down to, well, you can set things down to a thousandth. Um, so if you do in a mortise or something and it need, it's a little small, you can actually widen it by a, a thousandth of an inch at a time. And it actually seems to work pretty well. I don't know exactly what that uh, accuracy is, but uh, um, certainly for woodworking, it's uh, um, so it's certainly so Keith. Yeah, the the, the breadboard ends. The, these have are they're they're grain oriented uh, perpendicular to the normal grain of the wood. Yeah, the breadboard ends are a absolutely yeah perpendicular, and that's what you use to keep it. Uh, um, that's what you use to keep it from warping. But that's right. also why you have to create those slots at the end because they uh, wood expands across the grain, but not along the grain. Right, so the, the the center part will try and expand one way, and the the breadboard ends will try and expand the other, and they cancel each other out. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and here right. I just gave it. Go ahead. I got a question about the router. Does it guide itself? No. What it does is that you guide it. It shows you where you're supposed to go on that little screen. Right. Um, but if you ever use a router, you know that it, it uh, it's really hard to control down to really fine grain. So right. it does has it what is control? pardon? Does it help you control it? It does. So it has what this called. I don't know whether you can actually see it. If you go into that screen, that little circle. Um, so yeah, that little circle. I think they call it something like the correction circle. If you keep it um, where you are within that circle. It will correct for any deviations that you have, and that circles maybe, and it change that circle size changes based on the size of the router bit. But for like a quarter inch router bit, it's probably three quarters of an inch or so. So you got to be semi close, but not super close, and it'll 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 correct everything else for you. Oh wow, that's pretty neat. Thanks. Yeah, it is. It is cool. Yep. All right. If you uh, 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 zoom back out, please. All right. It's called the Shaper Origin. Um, 
and here I'm just uh, putting some inlay in. And, and once again, I use that ability to, to resize things. So this is actually the cut into the wood. Um, and then I, I cut um, a different piece of wood to actually fit into that. And uh, I actually had to go back and bump it up by a thousand of an inch to get that good, that good fit. Yeah, so maybe next slide has the, has it with the inlay in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the final thing. Awesome. All right. And is that, is that everything? Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you for showing us. Sure. All righty. And now we have Carrie with the mechatronic positioning system. Hi. Okay. Um, so I, I don't I really only have uh, one picture of this thing. Uh, maybe you can pull it up now. Um, so uh, basically, uh, I, I got I got asked to to uh, share a project I had done. Uh, I've, I've, I haven't really worked on anything uh, in a couple years. Uh, I just finished school, so I'm sort of like in between things right now. Uh, but this is this is something I built uh, about a, a few years ago. This is my uh, positioning system. Um, so basically, what we had to do is uh, position an actuator within like uh, two or three millimeters on sort of like a two-dimensional surface, and it needed to be extensible. Um, so basically, th this is what I built. Um, so basically, how this thing works is you have these these rail systems. Uh, I can't really point on the screen, otherwise I'd be pointing to the rails. Uh, but they're, these they're rails? On, yeah, yeah, that rail and 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 the and the other rails. Uh, this yeah, rail? there you go. Yeah. So and basically the idea is you'd be able to sort of like lay these rails down, almost like a like a railroad rail or something like that, and then you have this cart that uh, is able to to move along the rails, and basically what how this things works is that uh, the, the cart um, uses a friction drive, um, and it's uh, you have a a big uh, neoprene wheel that's held down by a, a gas spring, and it's driven along by a stepper motor, and uh, those are are lidars. Uh, they're actually uh, what, what when they are is uh, fluke fluke range finders that have been hacked up uh, to uh, get it, get a, a digital signal out of it. Um, and that feeds all back into a microcontroller that uh, controls the positioning of the cart and they're controlled uh, in unison so they, they, they don't uh, get too far away from each other. I think the, 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 the delta needs to be within like, like five or six millimeters if I, I recall correctly. Uh, and this all feeds back into uh, each, each cart has a little uh, Arduino microcontroller on it. And the Arduino is connected uh, via ethernet to uh, your computer and the control system is on the computer, and basically, the, you say go to you know x equals four uh, four meters or something like that. So, and then the control loop starts up, and it'll uh, drive the friction drive along till it reaches you know the lidar reads a certain value, and you know it'll stop if if the delta is too big, or and let the other cart catch up, and in that way you're able to sort of like position a, an actuator, uh, sort of a, a tool bit somewhere along this like XY plane within a, a couple millimeters. Uh, and that's the only picture I have of it. Um, okay. All righty. Was there anything else you wanted to say about it? No, 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 no. Uh, well, I, I haven't worked on this in this on this thing in a couple of years. Uh, it was just something I, I had laying around and uh, you asked me to present something. So uh, here's something. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, yeah, uh, hopefully I'll have like some sort of new project to share within like a couple of months. I'm sort of like getting a bench set up now, so it's, it, it takes some time uh, to do this sort of thing. Okay, yeah, I am. I definitely understand that projects take time. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much for that. Yep. And uh, now we're moving on to announcements. And so we've got a new members onboarding class coming up. Um, 
And that is going to be on the 8th. Um, anybody who hasn't taken one yet or who's thinking about wanting to be a member and would like to take one, this is a great time to hop in there. Also, older members, it's a great time to, you know, if you have the free time to be in there, meet some of the newer members, um, you know, just brush up on how things work, um, you know, can learn all kinds of stuff. Um, really can be helpful. All righty, and we have an intro to SMT. Um, is this, Isaac, is this your thing? Not hey, it's my thing. Uh, well, thing. it's okay. Ray's thing, really, but I'm going to be teaching this class uh, on Saturday. Um, SMT stands for Surface Mount Technology, and uh, that refers to the ultra small electronic parts that you can see on the board there uh, that look just like little bumps or nubbins, you know, not like the old school through hole at all. Um, we had a lot of requests for surface mount soldering classes over time. So uh, the illustrious Ray has assembled this now as the second uh, soldering kit that uh, is just kind of a fun project to put together and also lets you get your feet wet uh, in doing surface mount soldering. Um, the, uh, the work is a little bit tricky. Uh, it's not something I would recommend for somebody who's never soldered before. Although a soldering neophyte did attempt it with success last time to my astonishment. Uh, but if you have soldered at all, this isn't nearly as difficult as you might think it is. And we had a really good time putting together the last surface mount kit. Um, this is one that, uh, makes all sorts of, uh, sort of lo-fi, 8-bit chiptune sort of noises. Uh, it's cacophonous and annoying, uh, and you'll enjoy tormenting people with it. Um, and you'll also have the satisfaction of having surface mount soldered. Uh, that's uh, happening this Saturday at 10 a.m. until about noon. We have several tickets available, uh, and when you buy your ticket, then you get into the secret channel, and we'll tell you how to pick your uh, kit up at the workshop. So I hope to see several of you there. It will be a good time. All right. All righty. And this is an announcement. We've got nine Tuesdays before we will start meeting in person. All things continuing on as they have been. Hope everybody's out getting their vaccines or staying healthy. Um, you know, it'll all make it uh, easy for us to move into actually being together in person. That'll be a real novelty after a year. All righty, and uh, if there's anybody out there who would like to show and share, who is not a part of Knox Makers, um, you know, with our next nine Tuesdays, you can still get in on this um, and just email to this email address, sas at knoxmakers.org, um, and we'll get you on the roster and, uh, you know, you'll be live where we broadcast, and that would be awesome. We'd love to see your project. Come join us. All righty, and if you would like to uh, donate to Knox Makers, these are some easy ways to do it. If you're if you shop on Amazon, just register us as your uh, favorite charity, and every time you shop, uh, that will help us to uh, you know keep the shop going and the tools maintained um, and all of that. Um, and we would definitely be very grateful, always grateful. And that is it. That is the the completion of, of our Tuesday show and share. Um, you can turn the recording off because now we're just going to sit around and talk and, uh, you know, commence to chatting with each other.